Hello, and welcome to the Dark Matter Knits podcast, episode one. My name is Elizabeth Green Musselman, and um, in this episode, I want to talk to you a bit about what this podcast is going to be like, and actually do a short episode. All the episodes will be sort of short. So let me just explain a little bit about what this podcast is and, and why I'm doing it and how it's going to be a little bit different from um, some of the other podcasts that you might watch about knitting. Um, I have wanted to do a knitting podcast for a long time, really ever since I started listening to Cast On probably 10 years ago. And I've sort of watched enviously as other people have started podcasts and as video podcasts have become more possible. And I actually did a podcast for a while. It was about history of science, one of my other passions. Um, but I've really just always wanted to do a knitting podcast. And I finally decided to just go ahead and do it. But I also can't leave well enough alone. And I knew that if I started one, that I needed it to be something a little different from what's already out there. Not because I don't love what's already out there. In fact, uh, a number of people have inspired me with what they've done to start podcasting myself. I think, for example, of Mel from Single Handed Knits, who has such a wonderful way of taking her place wherever she is and using it as inspiration. Both as visual inspiration, showing you what's what's behind her, but also as inspiration for her knitting and her design and um, what she talks about. I also recently started watching, um, <laughs> I have no memory at all. <laughs> oh, it's Malia rhymes with Maria. Totally forgetting the name of her podcast right now, but I will put it in the show notes. And she has a wonderful podcast. that is kind of mostly about spinning, but also about knitting. And what I love about her is that every time she, she's seemingly just talking about what she's working on, but every project pretty much is an opportunity for her to teach you about some tool or some technique and she does it in this really um, charming and smart way so and there are lots of others but those are just oh and, and also fiberista files another one of my favorites because she talks about the growth of her business in in dying um, so I just I really love those kinds of unique, segments. And so what I want to do in this podcast is um, fairly short format. I'm thinking it'll probably be about 20 minutes at most for each episode every two weeks. And I want to do sort of a thematic ep podcast where each episode has a particular theme that loosely ties together. See what I did there? Ties together. The, um, the different things that I want to talk about that particular week. So the theme for this week is, of course, beginnings, appropriately. And as you'll see in a moment, each each one of the things that I want to talk about has something to do with beginnings. Um, and, you know, as the, as the weeks go on, I'll just sort of decide what makes the most sense for that week. But I'll, I'll sort of be focused less on what I'm actually working on, although that will come up as I'm talking. But I'd like to use what I'm working on more as an occasion for talking generally about um, knitting and its techniques and yarn and what's happening in the fiber industry. So I also want to tell you a little bit about myself too and um, just kind of the the perspective that I'm coming from in recording this podcast. I, um, I've actually recently undergone a really, and this is actually part of my beginnings theme here, is that I, a couple of years ago, went through a really dramatic career change. So I now work in the knitting industry, um, and I'll talk about that in a second. I started out, actually, in history. I um, started out in history in the 1970s. No, I started out working in history. I had, um, I went to graduate school, got a PhD in history, taught history for 13 years and and really loved it actually I mean it was a great career um, and I'm not sure I will ever entirely be able to explain why I felt the need to to change that pretty dramatically but I did and it was pretty unavoidable I mean for years I was really mulling this over 
And so I finally made the jump after, you know, a lot of research and a lot of contemplation. And I decided to go for it, just go for a career in the knitting world, which is definitely challenging. I mean, I've, I'm two years into this and it's still a real challenge financially and otherwise. Um, but it's uh, on the whole worked out really well. I, mostly what I do with my time is uh, my working time is that I uh, do book design for Cooperative Press, which is a um, an independent publisher. And in fact, you probably heard my name a number of times on other podcasts because I used to be the person that sent out all those books to uh, for people to review on their own podcasts. Um, I don't do that anymore. I just do the book design now. Somebody else takes care of the publicity, but. Um, I really love that. I love doing graphic design. I love having um, a kind of editing and uh, design entree, I suppose, into that world. And I, I love working with Shannon and, I, and MK and, and Jocelyn, the people who do most of the work for the press. It's, it's a great, it's a great job. Um, but I also do, um, that's sort of probably about half of my work, and the rest of it is a mixture of... Um, doing knitwear design of my own and uh, I do a lot of designing for men and boys particularly uh, but also some for women too. I um, I do some graphic design for other people in the fiber industry and I teach a lot of knitting classes. I'm about to teach an Antarsha class tomorrow. I'm a little nervous about that. <laughs> um, yeah maybe more about that in a moment. And um, yeah, I just, I kind of do a variety of, of freelance things. And, and like I say, really love it. It's, it's scary sometimes. Um, but, you know, cliche alert, but you live once, right? I had to do it. So, um, so that's my, my career life. Um, uh, I'm also a mom. I have a kid who is nine years old and he is, I, I'm telling you, you may think you have the funniest child in the world, but I have the funniest child in the entire world. He, he kills me. He's nine. I think I said that. I adore him. So you, to your chagrin or not, will probably hear stories about him. In fact, there will be one later today, sort of about his knitting. Sorry about the... It's cedar season here in Austin. Oh my gosh. Okay. So that's a little about me. I live in Austin, Texas as I just mentioned. Um, it's beautiful here. It's a great place to be a crafty person, despite the fact that it's hotter than blazes for about six months out of the year. There are a lot of knitters here, inexplicably, a lot of crocheters, a lot of fiber people in general. And um, I think it's just, a, you know, it's a city that values making things with your hands. So that's a, it's been a, a very good place to, to be that sort of person. So I think that's enough about me for now. I'm sure more will come out as time goes on. Um, I wanted to, uh, so here's what I want to talk about in the rest of the episode that all kind of ties in with the beginnings thing. I've talked about the beginning of the podcast and what kind of format it's going to take. I've talked a little bit about the beginning of my new career um, as a knitting person. And, um, you know, probably say more about that as time goes on too, because I think that's something that a lot of people are interested in and, you know, the various foibles and, um, you know, maybe some advice that I can pass along. I'll certainly be happy to talk about that. Um, the uh, last two things that I want to talk about today, um, kind of on the theme of beginnings, are first of all, I want to talk about uh, teaching kids to knit, because that was something that I uh, really kind of out of the blue ended up doing this week. Um, so, you know, on this theme of beginnings, getting little kids to begin to knit is something that I always find really interesting. Um, and then I want to, I, I want to try to incorporate some kind of uh, learning moment in each episode. So I'm also going to do, uh, record a segment where I show you a particular cast on, seemed like a good beginning sort of thing. Um, a cast on that is really great for ribbing and is a lot easier to do than the tubular cast on. So uh, first of all, to talk about teaching kids to knit, I, <laughs> I've actually taught a lot of kids to knit, and um, it's, I, I teach a lot of classes at Hill Country Weavers, which is a, uh, the, the biggest of the many local yarn stores in Austin, and um, 
And one of the things that uh, the owner of the store often has me teach classes that she doesn't think anybody else is patient enough to teach, <laughs> including um, teaching little kids. So they have a summer camp for kids age nine and up. And she wanted to offer something that was available for kids maybe, say, age five to nine. Um, so I teach a class pretty much every time the school system has a holiday. I teach classes for uh, kids age five and up on how to knit. And it's hilarious every time. I mean, it's everything from, um, I mean, it's always challenging, but not quite in the way that you'd think. Um, sometimes the biggest challenge, in fact, usually the biggest challenge, are the adults in the room, because I always make the adults stay. I can't handle that many little kids on my own. I just can't. And, um, and they're often kind of annoying. Um, the parents will, or grandparents in some cases, um, they have a set idea in their head of what their child is supposed to accomplish in this time frame. I love that idea that like classes are supposed to accomplish something, that this five-year-old, you know, is supposed to attain knitting. And, um, so they'll sometimes get a little flustered if their child is not, um, I don't know, like hasn't gone through some kind of Po moment in Kung Fu Panda where suddenly it all clicks. Um, I just feel like if they have tried the craft and enjoyed the trying of the craft, my work is done, right? So, um, so that's one of the challenges. I've also had kids, I mean, I had this little boy one time. It was hilarious. It was his idea to take the class um, but I think by the time he got there, he decided that it was just not the day for this. You know, he was just, and it's not all boys that are like this, but there are some little boys, right? And some little girls too, but mostly I see this in little boys where, um, they really want to learn. They do, but they're just so twitchy, right? And just some days it just, it's not going to happen. My son is like this and this little boy was like this and he just, he could not sit still and he's like rolling around under the table and you know, I'm trying to, I'm like, how about finger knitting? <laughs> We're like trying finger knitting and oh, that's fine for about three minutes. And then he's moaning again under the table and how about crocheting? And we've tried crochet and universal sign language for crochet. And uh, that didn't really work either. And you know, it was fine. He was entertained, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, I just kind of, you know, it's funny because, so I've talked about the challenges of teaching children, but here's something interesting about little kids is that um, when I have taught adults how to knit, one thing I've noticed is that they tend to get frustrated more quickly, in beginning knitting classes especially, um, because, and I think this is the key, adults are not accustomed to having to learn something completely new. Right? I mean, how many times have you been in a situation where you had to pick up something entirely new and you felt completely physically incompetent at it? It's not a very common experience for most adults. It is a completely common experience for children, especially young children. So you get them between the ages of, say, five and nine when they're already starting to learn to write, so their hand, their fine motor skills are pretty good. But they're not at that age where they feel like, I already know everything. It's a narrow window, I, I know. But if you get them in that window, they're just like, sure. I am not at all surprised that I suck at this. But like everything else, I'm just going to keep trying. And maybe I'll get it. You know, they're just kind of, for the most part, they're just really chill about learning how to knit. And I saw this last night. The reason why all this came up in my in my head for this week was that uh, my son plays basketball at the Y and um, there were these two little girls sitting in the bleachers with me as I was, um, you know, watching him practice for basketball. And they were obviously like two little sisters of some of the other kids that were playing and, um, and not related to each other. They were from separate families. And they're sitting on either side of me watching me knit last week. And they're just riveted, right? But they're both these really shy little girls, so they're riveted like this. They're like... And then I look at them, and then they're like... So, <laughs> I'm talking to one of their moms, 
and uh, and I and she says, "Do you teach knitting classes anywhere?" And so I tell her this whole thing about, "Yeah, I teach these knitting classes at Hill Country Weavers," and she's thinking about signing up, but she's just like kind of looking at me blankly as I'm telling her all the details of how these classes work. And I said, look, how about next week I just bring some yarn and some needles and we'll, we'll just learn how to knit during basketball practice. It's an hour. We can, I can teach them how to knit in an hour. And really, you would do this? She offers to pay me for the yarn and for the needles. I'm like, oh, honey, <laughs> I have so much yarn and so many bamboo needles that I do not need. So I'll just bring them. So, and I look over and the other little girl is looking up at me. And I said, would you like me to bring you some yarn and needles too? Yes, she does. So I brought them this week. And um, and they both sat there, you know, diligently screwing up mightily and just not being phased by it at all. And just continuing on and splitting the yarn and dropping stitches and things are falling off. And I messed up and we just get it back on and they're fine. And no frustration, no... You know, no getting upset, no quitting. You know, they, I mean, they stopped after a while, but not until they'd actually gotten it. And I thought when they go home and take this yarn and needles with them, they will totally be able to do it without my help. It was so cool. And, um, and the one little girl, the one who, you know, was like, yes, please, I want you to bring yarn and needles for me, was mashed against my arm. I don't even know how she knit because she was just like up against me. It was so sweet. And, um, and I, the only needles I could find for her were those really long, straight needles, you know? I mean, they were just ridiculous. She's like six, this tiny little six-year-old, and she's got these giant needles. And, um, and so every time she's like trying to get the right-hand needle down through that little hole, you know, to catch the yarn, the end of the needle is like swinging up into my face because, you know, she's like mashed up against me. It was so cute. And I tried, I tried scooting over a little bit to give her some more room and she's just whack, right back up against me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess the upshot of all of this is that if you have the opportunity to teach a little kid how to knit, don't pass it up. Um, they are some of the most, in some ways, the easiest people to teach because they are used to being taught. It's really interesting. So beginnings, and I wanted to show you, I said I would bring up my son. I'm not really gonna talk about it that much here, but, um, and I will try not to overload you with child stories because nobody needs that. Um, but I wanted to show you, this is his first knitting attempt. He, drew, he actually I taught him when he was about six too. And, um, he, uh, yeah, this is Malabrigo. That's how much I love my baby. This was his scarf. He insisted on knitting a scarf. I don't think that scarves are a great first knitting project because, hello, so much knitting. This is not, this is not long enough yet. It's going to be a while. Um, but he insisted. And, you know, this was from three years ago. And look, got little, <laughs> there's a lot of yarn overs in there. How it goes right and then this is the hat he started and I would like to say that at least two-thirds of these stitches were done by me I promised him he got so frustrated with how long it takes to to knit something that um, he asked if I would knit one row or maybe two or maybe three for every row that he knits <laughs> you can see where this is going right <laughs> also knitted probably three years ago. I don't think this is going to ever get finished. I don't dare rip it out though. No. This is the Malabrigo that will never, ever be knit. So beginnings of new knitters. I love pe teaching people to knit. Don't you? Do you love it? Have you had any terrible experiences teaching people to knit? I would love to know. Those are great stories. Okay, um, the last thing I wanna talk about is this how to do a cast on for ribbing. And so that's going to be a separate segment that I will insert here um, at the at very end of the episode. I'm so sorry about the nose thing, it's so gross. Um, let me just say that where you can find me, I am going to 
get this podcast up onto iTunes. That may take a little while. I know it always, um, there's a little bit of administrivia that happens with Apple. Um, but I will get it up onto iTunes. You can also find the podcast at darkmatternets.com, which is my, my website. And I have a, a group on Ravelry called Dark Matter Knits Fans. Um, it's partly, it started for my patterns, but I'm also going to have it for the podcast. And you can find me as Elizabeth GM on Ravelry. I'm Dark Matter Knits on Twitter. And I also have uh, an account on Facebook and, um, and a page on Facebook for Dark Matter Knits. So um, you can find me in each of these places, and I will look forward to talking to you again in a couple of weeks. Bye. Hey there. So I'm going to show you, as I said before, this cast on that is really great for, uh, particularly for one by one ribbing. So this would be a good cast on for a top down sock, for example, or a sleeve, anywhere where you're going to use, actually you could do this for one by one rib or any other kind of ribbing. A lot of times for that sort of ribbing, you're told to use a tubular cast on, which I find to be a real pain in the butt to do. But this just, um, this is a nice, variation on the long tail cast on that um, is a lot easier to work than the tubular cast on but still has kind of a nice finished look to it. If you've done the long tail cast on before this will look very familiar. So here's how you start. You make a slip knot just like you normally would and just kind of get that tightened up on the needles. And I should say where I first heard about this is in, um, I did the embossed leaves socks, which appeared in interweave knits in winter 2005. It's a pattern by Mona Schmidt. They're beautiful socks. And she recommends this cast on for the top of the socks. And I thought it was really fascinating. So you probably, if you've done the long tail cast on, you may do it this way. Um, if you've not done it this way before, I will show you how to do it. You basically, you know, when you do a long tail cast on, you've got to have a pretty long tail, as the name would suggest, because you're going to use it actually in the cast on. So I've got probably about two feet of yarn here on the tail. And I'm actually going to rest both of those strands over my hand and close my bottom three fingers over those strands. Put my thumb and forefinger in between the strands and spread them out like that. So you should have a kind of diamond shape here with the right hand needle at the top, your bottom three fingers at the bottom, and your pointer and your thumb spreading them out. Okay, so when I bring the needle down, there's a little V shape here. Now the first stitch I'm going to do is going to be a knitted, a knit cast on or a you know a cast on knitted stitch. So it'll look like the regular long tail cast on. I go under the thumb loop here, over the finger loop here, and then just go back down through the thumb loop. Let my thumb out of the loop and reopen it here at the bottom. And what that does is it actually tightens up the stitch on the needle. So I'm going to do one more knitted one just in case you've never seen this before. I'll do a K2P2 cast on here. So I'll go under the thumb loop into the finger loop coming from the top straight back down through the thumb loop pull my thumb out and then just come back down here and spread out the diamond again. Okay, so that's that's actually a regular long tail cast on. Here's the here's what happens when you need a purl stitch. So let's say this is going to be a knit two purl two rib. I just realized I messed that up because these are three stitches now. So these would be three knit stitches, but we'll just ignore that for a second. Let's say the next stitch I need is a purl stitch. I'm just going to do basically the opposite of what I did with the knit stitch. You come around here to the finger loop and kind of, you know, come underneath it and up. Come down through the thumb loop this way and then come back through the finger loop. This time let your finger 
come out and spread the diamond out again. So again, that's into the finger loop by coming you know, around the back this way and under, down through the thumb loop, and down through the finger loop. Pull out your finger and respread. And let me just show you what that does. Hopefully this will, I'm gonna have to pull it away a little bit to try to focus it. Um, what you will see along the bottom is that there's actually little pearl bumps here that will blend nicely in with the pearl stitches that come up from here and these will look more like knit stitches. So it's just a slightly more finished edge for any kind of ribbing project.